Hello there, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The John Allen Show, brought to you by the good people at the Word on Fire Institute. I am John Allen. I am the editor of Crux, an independent online Catholic news source. You can find us at cruxnow.com. That's cruxnow.com. We are your one-stop shopping destination for the very best in smart, wired, and independent Catholic journalism. I'm also the host of The Crux of the Matter on the Catholic Channel, Sirius XM 129. We air Mondays at 1 p.m. Eastern, so give us a listen if you can. That's Sirius XM 129 on your radio dial. And I am also a proud fellow at the Word on Fire Institute of Bishop Robert Barron. You can find all of their resources at wordonfire.institute. That's wordonfire.institute. You will find the latest and greatest from Bishop Barron and much more beyond. Check it out. Bookmark it. Rate it faithfully. It is well worth the time. I'm coming to you again from the Rome studios of our good friends at Longbeard, a digital marketing and design company. They're the best in the business. Do check them out as well. Their studios here are located right next to the Grand Basilica of St. Mary Major, where you will find in the Borghese Chapel the uh, historic famed icon of Maria Salus Popoli Romani, Mary Health of the Roman People, who has seen Rome through many a storm. We like to place this show under her patronage, so Maria Salus Popoli Romani, ora pro nobis. All right. This week is the middle of August. We are inching up on August 15th, which, of course, is the Feast of the Assumption. Now, that is, of course, an important holy day throughout the Catholic world, but here in Italy, it is something else. Uh, It is the pivot pivot point of Ferragosto. Uh, These are the traditional August holidays uh, in Italy. Uh, The term Ferragosto comes from two Latin words, Ferie Augusti. They were holidays decreed by the Emperor Augustus uh, in ancient Rome. In modern Italy, uh, they are basically an excuse to blow town for most of the month. So what most Italians will do, starting right around now, uh, is they pack the kids, pack the car, uh, and head for either the beach or the mountains, or both. Uh, My wife and I this year are doing both. We are going to Senegalia on the Adriatic coast to hit the beach for a couple days, and then we are heading up to Val d'Aosta in northern Italy on the border with France and Switzerland to spend a week at the foot of Monte Bianco, the the tallest peak uh, in Europe, and more importantly, a place where it's about 20 degrees cooler every day uh, than it is in Rome during August. Now, uh, Pope Francis, of course, does not take such a vacation. He is the pontiff of the staycation, but a good chunk of his workforce will, uh, which means also in the Vatican, things tend to slow down from about this time until about early September. And there's always a push right before that happens to get things out of the pipeline, to to check things off a to-do list, to clear your desk uh, before you head for the beach or the hills. And so we have seen a flurry of Vatican activity in the last few days. Three important decisions. Uh, One uh, involves the Arabian Peninsula. Basically, Pope Francis has decided to return authority to patriarchs of the Eastern Catholic churches, those 23 churches in full communion with Rome, but that have their own leadership, their own liturgies, uh, their own spirituality. Uh, He's returning authority to them uh, that was taken away in 2003 uh, under St. John Paul II. He's not returning it 100%, though. Uh, There are a few ifs and buts. Uh, We will unpack uh, all of that. Uh, Secondly, Pope Francis has appointed new members to his Council for the Economy. That is the policy-setting body created by this pope in 2014 to oversee Uh, his financial reform of the Vatican and also routine financial management, in theory, once that reform is accomplished. Uh, Now, the main headline uh, is that he is appointed of seven new lay members. Six of them are women, uh, and this is being hailed as a significant breakthrough for women in the Vatican, a kind of concrete application of the Pope's rhetoric about finding ways to empower women short of ordaining them as priests. And finally, the Vatican has also issued a ruling on the formula of baptism, basically saying 
you got to use the traditional formula or the baptism is invalid. We will unpack all of that. And as a bonus vacation item, I'm also be going to be giving you a brief lesson in patience and perspective from the streets of Rome. All that and more is waiting for you on the other side of a short break. Those are our headlines. Stick around for the context. Hey everybody, this is Jared Zimmer, the director of the Word on Fire Institute. I hope you're enjoying this episode of the John Allen Show, yet another production brought to you by the Word on Fire Institute. I wanted to just take a minute of your time to tell you a little bit about what you receive as a member of the Institute. Uh, so the Institute exists to be a formation arm of Bishop Barron's apostolate Word on Fire. We offer specialized courses in theology, philosophy, spirituality, practical evangelization, numerous other topics to help form you to be the best evangelist that you can be. Along with those courses, you have a lively forum where you can discuss the courses with the other students as well as the professors. Uh, you also get a quarterly journal called Evangelization and Culture. In that journal, we have interviews with folks such as Dave Rubin, uh, Dr. Arthur Brooks. We discuss culture and cinema, you name it. We will bring it to you again as another tool to help you learn good evangelization in the modern world. Along with your membership, you also get free access to Word on Fire Digital. We're talking about hundreds of hours of Bishop Barron's content, so his feature films, his study series. Uh, you also get a free book, um, Bishop Barron's latest book called Centered, really diving deep into the spirituality of Word on Fire. Uh, so be sure to go to wordonfire.institute to learn more, and we'd love to see you inside. Welcome back. Okay, as I said, uh, the first story we're going to try to take apart and put back together this week uh, is a decision Pope Francis has made regarding the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, and specifically, uh, who is responsible for the small but obviously very important Catholic minority uh, on the Arabian Peninsula? Now, the Arabian Peninsula, obviously, the, the, the dominant country there is Saudi Arabia, but it includes six other nations, uh, Bahrain, Kuwait, Yemen, the United Arab Emirates, uh, and so on. Uh, ecclesiastically, it's divided into two jurisdictions. Uh, there is the Apostolic Vicariate of Northern Arabia, uh, which includes Saudi Arabia, and then the Apostolic Vicariate of Southern uh, Arabia. Uh, and both of those jurisdictions are led by apostolic victor, vicars directly appointed by the Pope. However, uh, a good share uh, of the Catholics who are in uh, the Arabian Peninsula, and, and by the way, we're not generally talking about indigenous Catholic communities, but we're mostly talking about expats, uh, people who have come to the Arabian Peninsula often to work in the oil business, uh, in other cases to work as domestics uh, or in other capacities. Uh, a good share uh, of those Catholics uh, in their home, wherever they have come from, they belong to an Eastern Rite Church. Again, one of those 23 Eastern churches in full communion with Rome, but with their own leadership, their own liturgies, their own spirituality. So there are a lot of Lebanese, for instance, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula who at home uh, belong to the Maronite Church. Uh, there are a number of Egyptians who at home belong to the Coptic Catholic Church. Uh, there are Syriac Catholics from Iraq, from Syria, uh, who belong to the Syriac Catholic Church and so on. So the question has always been, uh, who's in charge uh, of those Catholics in the Arabian Peninsula? Who's responsible for them? Is it uh, the leadership of their home church, their home Eastern Rite Church, the patriarchs of those Eastern churches? Uh, or uh, is it the apostolic vicariates? Now, Strictly from an organizational management point of view, actually, it makes a lot more sense to put the apostolic vicariates in charge because there are so few Catholics to have several different jurisdictions, which historically do not work and play well with one another. Uh, to, to have all that for such a small group of people in an overwhelmingly Muslim context is a kind of a prescription for chaos. Uh, and there's also the question of who represents the church in conversations with the government, and obviously it's a lot easier to have one voice doing that than several. Uh, and so uh, that was the basis in 2003 in which uh, under St. John Paul II, the Vatican decided that uh, it was going to be the responsibility of the apostolic vicariates. Now that, however, uh, was taken as, however, a kind of slap in the face 
to the patriarchs of the Eastern churches because, of course, uh, the Arabian Peninsula and the people from their churches living there, uh, you know, historically uh, have been under their jurisdiction. Um, and it, Pope Francis very much believes in the idea of unity and diversity. Uh, he has tried to empower uh, the Eastern churches, which is of a piece with his larger ecumenical outreach to the Eastern Orthodox churches that are not in communion with Rome. Now, you know, from a, from a size point of view, uh, you could argue that doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, all in, those 23 Eastern Rite churches count about 12 million believers, which may sound like a lot, but bear in mind, there are 1.3 billion Roman Catholics in the world, so that's less than 1%. But this is a classic case in which for Pope Francis, size really doesn't matter. This isn't about de demography, it's about ecclesiology. And the idea that Catholicism is a community of communities. Uh, and so this is a decision of a piece with that, but it is circumscribed. Uh, the Pope has said that although uh, jurisdiction is being returned to the Eastern patriarchs, uh, that they have to promote a common pastoral plan and action because given the context of the Arabian Peninsula, nothing else makes sense. Uh, and they've also said that the vicars, uh, the vicars of Northern and Southern Arabia, will continue to be the primary interlocutors, conversation partners with the governments of the seven nations of the Arabian Peninsula, although the patriarchs are supposed to have a voice. So in effect, this is a small and limited, but symbolically significant gesture of respect by Pope Francis to those Eastern churches. All right, second decision that rolled out of the Vatican in its pre-vacation mini avalanche uh, is that the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, kind of the orthodoxy watchdog of the Vatican, has issued a ruling with regard to the formula for baptism. Uh, the Cardinal Luis Ladaria, the Spanish Cardinal who runs the congregation, said that there are some parts of the world in which people have been experimenting with a different formula. They have been saying when an infant is baptized, uh, in the name of the Father and the Mother, in the name of the Godfather and the Godmother, the grandparents, the family, and friends. We baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Of course, that is in contrast with the traditional formula of I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, the Congregation for the Faith has ruled that this alternative formula doesn't cut it. Uh, it's invalid. Therefore, baptisms uh, using that formula are invalid. Uh, and the person being baptized would have to be re-baptized for it to count using the proper uh, prescribed formula. Now, uh, Ladaria notes that the reason people have been experimenting with this alternative is to give value to the community, the idea being that the whole community has a stake in what's happening here. He certainly says that's theologically valid, uh, but uh, he notes that the core theological point here is that no matter who is performing the baptism, according to the church's theology, it is always Christ who baptizes. That is, the priest stands in persona Christi. He represents Christ in that moment. And therefore, any formula other than I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is not consistent with that theology. Now, this is a relatively small point, but it is uh, of a piece uh, with a larger picture, which is, there have been several cases recently in which Pope Francis has, in some ways, disappointed his progressive base. Uh, he has not authorized women deacons, despite forming not one, but two study commissions to look into that question, raising hopes that perhaps that was in the offing. At the conclusion of the Amazon Senate, he did not sign off on an expansion in the ordination of married priests. And here again, we find the Pope uh, backing a position that conventionally in political argot would be described as a conservative one. Uh, it will be very interesting to see whether one of the narratives going forward uh, is a kind of growing disenchantment in some ways among sectors of opinion in the church that over these eight years have been most excited about and therefore most, most supportive of Pope Francis. Finally. Uh, Pope Francis, uh, in recent days, also appointed a slew of new members to the Council for the Economy. That is his chief policy-setting body 
for economic affairs in the Vatican. Let's remember that when Pope Francis was elected in March 2013, a core element of the mandate he received from the cardinals who elected him was a thoroughgoing reform of the Vatican, which was to begin with its financial operations. The Vatican, of course, over the years, has often been a magnet for scandal and embarrassment uh, when it comes to money management. I mean, one need only think of the celebrated Vatican Bank scandals of the 1970s and so on. Uh, and so Pope Francis uh, was seen as the man who would clean up all of that. He launched a very aggressive reform at the beginning, uh, creating three new bodies, the Council for the Economy to oversee the reform, a secretariat for the economy to implement the reform, and an auditor general, an independent auditor general, to oversee those two other bodies and to make sure that everyone was keeping their nose clean. Now, most people would say that over these eight years, uh, that reform has brought only mixed results. Uh, in many ways, there is a perception that those three new bodies uh, have had their wings clipped, that a great deal of power has been recentralized in the Vatican Secretariat of State, which is kind of the 800-pound gorilla on the Vatican scene. It is the major coordinating department that kind of oversees, in a sense, uh, everyone else. Uh, and there is also a, a perception uh, that some of the promised reforms have been more words on paper than actual fact. Uh, evidence of that, uh, in, in some people's eyes, would be a recent scandal that unfolded uh, in which the Secretariat of State took about $220 million out of Peter's Pence, which is the fund uh, for the proceeds of the annual collection to support the activities of the Pope uh, around the world. Usually it's marketed as a way for ordinary people to contribute to papal charities. Uh, but in this case, the Secretary of State took $225 million uh, of those funds uh, to buy a piece of property in the posh London neighborhood of Chelsea, uh, a former warehouse uh, belonging to the Harrods department store that a developer uh, sold to them as a kind of unique fixer-upper opportunity. It was to be converted into luxury apartments. Uh, and the idea, is, and it's, it's pretty good real estate, the idea was that the earnings uh, off those apartments would more than repay the initial investment. The Vatican, however, uh, soured uh, of its relationship with that initial financier and so found another Italian financier to help them buy out, to attempt to buy out the rest of the property. Uh, so that they would be the sole owners of it. Uh, that ran afoul uh, of the board of the Vatican Bank, which felt that this request for an emergency loan uh, was suspect. Uh, it got reported uh, to the Vatican uh, magistrates, prosecutor of justice, uh, and it is now the subject uh, of a criminal investigation in the Vatican. Critics would say, how in the world uh, is that kind of thing possible eight years into the Francis Revolution if these reforms were actually for real? However, uh, of late, there is evidence of new momentum uh, behind these reforms, and the appointment of these new members of the Council for the Economy uh, is of a piece with that. Uh, probably the big headline uh, is that six of the seven are lay women, uh, including a former Minister of Transportation in the UK, uh, and the former treasurer of Prince Charles in the UK. Two of the women are British, two are German, and two are Spanish, uh, along with one Italian. Uh, this clearly is a major step towards empowerment uh, of women uh, on the Vatican scene. Uh, one of the unique things you should know about the Council for the Economy uh, is that it is what the Italians would call a caso unico, that is a, a lone case in the Vatican in which the lay members of a decision-making body are full equals. They have the same voting rights uh, as the cardinals and archbishop and monsignori uh, who sit on this council. Uh, so uh, the Pope also appointed Cardinal Joe Tobin of Newark, New Jersey, uh, along with these women to the Council for the Economy. When Tobin sits at the table, the next time the Council for the Economy meets, either virtually or face-to-face, uh, his vote will not count any more uh, than the vote uh, of uh, the laywoman from Great Britain or the laywoman from Spain. Uh, and so in that case, this is 
lay people, and specifically women, exercising real decision-making authority in the name of the Pope. And for that reason, uh, this has been seen and as, a, as an important step towards Francis making good on his promise to find ways to empower women short uh, of ordination to the priesthood. There is another footnote to this uh, that I think uh, is worth uh, paying some attention to, which is I have already written that we are in what I've called uh, the 2.0 stage of Francis's attempt at Vatican reform and specifically financial reform. 1.0, the original reform, was, to be honest, largely an Anglo-German enterprise. Uh, Pope Francis brought in Cardinal George Pell of Australia to run the, his uh, secretariat for the economy. Uh, and then there were these cluster of consultants brought in. Oh, and German Cardinal Reinhard Marx to head the Council for the Economy. Then there was this cluster, this galaxy of consultants. Erst and Young, KPMG, McKinsey, and so on, who were assigned pieces of it, uh, almost all of whom uh, are either English-speaking or German in terms of uh, the, the bulk uh, of the, the sociology of the companies. Um, and that was always in some ways destined to, to be a, a tough thing to digest for a pope who is far more at home in Italian and in Spanish than he is in anything else, uh, and whose comfort zone is in those cultures. So now the Reform 2.0 uh, is that the lion's share of positions and responsibility have been allocated either to Italians or Spanish speakers. His new team at the Secretariat for the Economy is a Spanish Jesuit, and just as in recent days, his deputy is a Spanish layman, Minimo Caballero, uh, who is a veteran Spanish banker who grew up in the same town with Father uh, Juan Guerrero, who runs the Secretariat for the Economy. They are childhood friends. Uh, and I suspect these two Spanish laywomen, now named to the Council for the Economy, are going to have extremely important roles as part of this informal circle of people Francis trusts and listens to on the reform. Basically, Reform 1.0 was, if you've got a perceived Italian problem, bring in non-Italians to fix it, especially uh, Anglo-Germans. Reform 2.0 is if you've got an Italian problem, bring in Italians and other Mediterraneans that you actually trust to fix it. We will see how it plays out. All right, those are the week's headlines. Now, one final note uh, for this podcast. Uh, and this is not tied to a particular news story, but it is simply one of those evergreen, eternal lessons that you can learn simply from moving about in the city of Rome. St. John Paul II, uh, who of course was the Bishop of Rome for almost 27 years, used to like to tell seminarians who were studying here, uh, he would charge them to imparare Roma, uh, an Italian phrase meaning learn Rome. The idea was just moving around the streets of this city can be an education in Catholicism, both its glories and its grubbiness. And a recent experience of mine sort of brings that point home. Uh, my wife and I were married in January. Prior to that, we each had separate apartments in the Vatican area of Rome. Obviously, we needed a new place when we got married, so we moved across town. Uh, now, on the map, our move was just about two miles, not that far. It's about 10 minutes in a cab. Uh, but historically and culturally, we moved about 800 years, and we moved from one side of the defining modern controversy in Italian life to the other. Because where we used to live, that was Papal Rome. The main street running through it was named after Pope Gregory VII, uh, Gregory the Great, from the 10th and 11th centuries. Uh, the streets that radiated off of it were named for cardinals and bishops and monsignori, all of whom in one way or another were involved in the periods when the papacy was also the secular government of Rome. Where we are now uh, is Republican Rome. Uh, the, the heart of our neighborhood uh, is the Piazza Mazzini, named for Giuseppe Mazzini, who was the intellectual architect of the Italian Risorgimento. That was the Republican movement in the 19th century, the explicit aim of which was to end papal rule in the middle of Italy, to bring down the papal states, and to unify the country. Uh, the, the four streets 
that surround our apartment complex uh, are named for a general in the army of Giuseppe Garibaldi, who was the commander of the forces of the Risorgimento, who led the war on the Papal States. Uh, they're named for another military leader uh, who, by the way, uh, spent a good deal of time in New Orleans, where he was once deported by the Papal States, uh, and later New York, uh, but then returned to fight alongside Garibaldi. Uh, and two women who were protagonists in the short-lived Republic of Naples in 1789, which was seen as a precursor to the Risorgimento. So uh, we are now a smack dab in the middle of erstwhile enemies of the Pope and of the papacy. Uh, however, here's the thing worth noting. Uh, that was the 19th century. Flash forward to today. Italians today who would consider themselves sort of spiritual heirs to Mazzini and Cavour and the other architects of the Risorgimento, that is, Italians who believe in a democratic Italy that takes its place as part of a community of nations in Europe that believes in the European destiny of Italy uh, and that also believes that Italy has a role to promote Christian humanism on the global stage. That was the vision of Mazzini and Cavour. Those today who would most ardently share that vision in Italian life, today would see the papacy and the Vatican as an ally, not an enemy. They would see the, the social teaching of the Catholic Church and the diplomatic translation of that social teaching coming from all modern popes as the closest natural ally that they have, uh, and they would see it as a precious resource against other secular forces in Italian life who are questioning that Republican project. I mean, in other words, yesterday's enemies have become today's best friends. And on the church's side, the same thing is true. Uh, Pope Paul VI in 1970, now St. Paul VI, famously sent his vicar of Rome, Cardinal Delacqua, to the 100th anniversary celebrations uh, of the fall of the Porta di Roma, the, the, the entryway to Rome that marked uh, the end of the Papal States and the creation of the Italian Civil Republic, um, which at the time popes abhorred. They declared themselves prisoners of the Vatican for almost a century because they refused to accept its legitimacy. But by 1870, St. Paul VI said that it was actually the greatest favor anyone ever did the, the papacy, that the loss of its secular and temporal power freed up the papacy to focus on its evangelizing and its spiritual mission. And the revitalization of the papacy in modern times, the emergence of modern popes, as enormously consequential voices of conscience in global affairs demonstrates the truth. Uh, of St. Paul VI insight. So on both sides, my point is this, on both sides, uh, there has been this grand rapprochement. People who were once seen as implacable enemies, ideas that were once seen as totally anathema, have now come to be seen as friends and as today's orthodoxy. And the lesson there is a lesson in perspective and patience. Because the same thing may well be true of the people that we love to demonize today, people we consider uh, unalterable enemies uh, to everything we hold dear, uh, ideas that we consider repugnant, repulsive, hideous with the passage of time may come to be seen with the benefit of hindsight actually has having done us great historical favors. This, ladies and gentlemen, is an invitation to perspective and it is an invitation to patience. Now, in Rome, there is an elite school for, for diplomats, people who are going to be former or future envoys and ambassadors for the Pope, located in the city's Piazza Minerva. Uh, it is called the Academia. And in the Academia, uh, and it's a very prestigious place. It, it's very tough to get in there, but for this cream of the crop, they teach graduate seminars in this kind of thing, uh, intended to impart in their future diplomatic corps these virtues of perspective and patience. But ladies and gentlemen, I am here to tell you 
you do not have to pay thousands of dollars. You do not have to pay to get into an elite diplomatic school. You don't have to take exams or sweat blood. If you want to learn the same things, all you have to do is walk around the streets of Rome with your eyes open and you will have the education of a lifetime. All right, that's our show for this week. Thanks for being with us. We will see you again in a fortnight. In the meantime, stay healthy, stay happy, stay safe, have a blessed couple of weeks, and we will talk to you again soon.